our talk today is called The Power of Forgiveness. I could have given it the negative title, The Bondage of Unforgiveness. But I don't want to do that. I want to be positive. So The Power of Forgiveness. I have a lot of practice with forgiveness, more than most students, because I'm older than you are. So I've had 55 years of practice messing up and asking for forgiveness and having others mess up and me forgiving them. I have three brothers, so you can imagine. And I've been married for 32 years, so you can imagine my poor wife, how many times I've had to ask for forgiveness, as in this morning and yesterday. (laughs) Been teaching here at Biola for 17 years. Probably 50% of my students who come and talk to me tell me that they struggle with unforgiveness. My guess is that the number is probably 90% or maybe 98%. Let me give you two examples. These are pretty heavy ones. One, I had a student whose dad was a narcissist. That means that he was all about himself. This is from a number of years ago. And you can imagine as a a daughter, when your dad is about himself and not about you, it caused a lot of pain in her life. Can you forgive a dad like that? Or another student, she actually was abused by her brother when she was very young. Her dad found out and he did nothing. He told this young girl to forget about it. Can you imagine? A dad whose job it is to protect didn't do that. So she grew up with a lot of hurt and anger and bitterness and flashbacks and cried herself to sleep for years. Can you forgive a dad like that or a brother like that? Now, it's probably not that hard for you, but I'm sure you've had a roommate that has driven you crazy or maybe a couple of them, a professor that makes you work too hard like the John test coming up Wednesday, or a boyfriend or girlfriend, or an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, or a coach. That's the one that's tough for me. We won't go into examples there. Or a youth pastor that didn't give you enough attention, or parents that just, well, you know, they're just parents. That's what we do. See if this works. There we go. You see, hurts and sins that are not dealt with, they leave lasting wounds and anger and bitterness, and ultimately that can lead to unforgiveness. And that's not good. Today, this is a really easy topic in terms of content. I probably won't say anything, maybe one thing you've never heard before. Eh, One thing, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard. But other than that, it's pretty easy. But I'll bet you that this is one of the toughest sermons to apply that you'll hear this morning. That was a joke, you guys. Admit, students, I'm a little bit sarcastic. I'm trying to keep it cool. Do you struggle with unforgiveness? Now, I was talking with someone recently, and they said, oh, I've heard lots of sermons on unforgiveness and unforgiveness, and I didn't think I struggled with this. And then they laughed and said I was so wrong. So be honest, do you struggle with unforgiveness and can people who have been hurt truly forgive? Can you forgive people who have hurt you even for deep, deep pains? Well, let me start off with why we don't forgive. I have seven reasons, there's more than seven. The first is we think that we hold power over the one who hurt us if we don't forgive them. We think that we hold power over them. I heard someone say that it's kind of like we want to poison them, but we're drinking the poison. That's that's not true. We don't hold power over anyone by not forgiving them. We think the one who hurt us needs to repent first, and there seems to be some biblical verses that talk about this, but I don't think that this is true, and I'll explain why in a little bit. We equate forgiveness with a lack of justice. If I forgive them, they're getting off the hook. And they shouldn't get off the hook because it wouldn't be fair. And I think that God gave us a sense of justice and that's good when we're hurt that we feel that. 
But forgiving someone doesn't let them off the hook. It lets them off your hook and places them on Jesus' hook. And I'll talk about that more in a second, too. Fourth, we think that forgiveness requires reconciliation. Reconciliation is different than forgiveness. Sometimes forgiveness leads to reconciliation. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it probably shouldn't. If there's danger or abuse, we want to put up some pretty big boundaries to protect ourselves in those cases. So let's not equate those two things. We are incapable of forgiving, and so we don't forgive. This one's actually true. We are incapable of forgiving on our own strength and power. I think that's why God gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us to forgive other people. We think that the offense is too big to forgive. And sometimes it seems that way, but this isn't true either. And the last one, we think that they're just going to hurt us again, so why should I forgive them now? Well, they might hurt us again. And that's why I hand out the book Boundaries a lot. Have to protect ourselves sometimes. Well, why should I forgive? I don't know any reasons. I'm just kidding. First of all, forgiveness is biblical. Let's just start with that. Micah says that who is a God like you who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant? There's lots of verses. Psalm 86, you, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love. Jesus modeled forgiveness throughout his lifetime, even from the cross. Look at what he said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. That one I can't quite understand. That's, that's something else, isn't it? Be kind and compassionate, Paul tells us, to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And then the text that we read, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times? And that seemed like a lot in that day, in that culture. And Jesus says not seven times, but 77 times. Other versions and other manuscripts say 70 times seven So 77 or 490 times, and I don't think that Jesus is teaching us to count, okay? 75, 76, 77, 78, boom, and then we get them. Revenge time. I don't think that's what he's telling us. He even tells us to love our enemies. Ow, ow, that one's tough. So let's get that off the screen. We should forgive because it's biblical, but unforgiveness hurts us. It hurts us physically. Are you ready for this? Uh, Oh my goodness, you guys, my stress level's already high. Unforgiveness increases our stress levels. It increases our levels of cortisol. It shrinks the size of the brain cortex. I'm already working with this, this limited amount. It elevates the risk of heart attacks and strokes. I taught this lesson on unforgiveness about a month ago to uh, uh, an older Sunday school class at a church. And before they started, they said, any prayer requests? And about three of them were on heart disease. And I thought, oh, just wait till I talk about unforgiveness. It increases your risk of heart attacks and strokes. It increases your blood pressure. It decreases your immune system functions. Now, no one knows what that means except the nurses over here. It means you're going to get sick more often. So students, you feeling sick? I won't ask you to say that out loud. It hurts us physically. It hurts us emotionally. It increases our fear, our anger, our bitterness, our sadness, our shame. Uh Uh-oh. Does that say anxiety? 40 to 60% of Biola students and nationwide college students will struggle with anxiety and depression this year. Unforgiveness increases that number. Maybe we can lower that number. It hurts us relationally. Those who have been hurt tend to hurt others, right? Unless we break that cycle. And the only way to break that cycle is through forgiveness. And here's the one thing that I might offer that's new today. It hurts us spiritually. If you read books on spiritual warfare, you will read that spiritual warfare experts say that the number one open door to giving Satan some inroads into your life is unforgiveness. 
It's unforgiveness. Now, I don't know about you guys. I don't want to give them any open doors. So I want to forgive, and I want to forgive as quickly as I can to not give him any room in my life. Well, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness does not deny. Let me just pause. Whew, you guys, this is heavy, right? I'm supposed to be the funny professor. Forgiveness does not deny that an offense has occurred. Let's be honest. Offenses occur. They occur. It does not mean forgetting. We will remember, but we will remember differently. We remember the sin as forgiven, the hurt as forgiven. Forgiveness does not deny justice. As I mentioned earlier, it takes justice away from you and gives it to Jesus. And he can handle it much better than we can, can't he? Because if they repent of their sins that they did towards you, Jesus can forgive them and show them grace and mercy. But if they don't repent, he can handle justice. He can. And if you're not sure, just go look at the book of Revelation again. That book we don't want to read because it's too scary. He can handle justice. Forgiveness is a gift. And most people who write on forgiveness will talk about giving a gift to others, but based on those things we, we read earlier on how it hurts us physically and emotionally and relationally and spiritually, it's a gift not just to them, but to who? Sorry, grammar people. To whom? <laughs> it's a gift to ourselves as well when we forgive other people. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation, as I mentioned earlier. Forgiveness is letting go. It's letting go of things like anger and hatred and rage and bitterness, or in the words of Disney, let it go. It's for you, Mackenzie. Can people who have been hurt truly forgive even big hurts and pains and sins against us? Yes. Yes, they can, and I wanted to put in Bob the Builder, but I was told not to do that. Can we forgive them? Yeah, we can. <laughs> so now, instead of the unforgiveness examples, I want to give the forgiveness examples of these two people that I started with. You see, I've seen over and over and over again in my office that it is possible to forgive. It's hard, it's difficult, it might be the one, of, one of the most difficult things that we can do. If it's the biggest open door that we can give Satan, it's one of the hardest things that we can do. Sometimes when I've walked with people through forgiveness, I've felt like an earthquake hit, literally. But then I realized that nothing was shaking, it was just a spiritual earthquake, which is probably scarier. But that student did forgive. So let's go back to these two examples, the dad who is narcissistic. The student prayed, and I'll talk in a minute about uh, how I do that. The student prayed. She hadn't seen her dad for about three years. She was filled with a lot of hurt and pain and bitterness towards her dad. She prayed through this. She forgave him. And wouldn't you know it, a week later, she saw her dad. He didn't see her. She saw him down at the beach after she graduated from Biola. He went past her, and she saw him. And I asked her afterwards, how'd that feel? And I was expecting to hear, well, it's my dad. He's hurt me. There's a lot of pain there. And she said, I was fine. I didn't have any of that anger and that rage and bitterness anymore. And I went, yes, yes, Lord. What about the person who was abused by her brother and her dad didn't do anything? This one was crazy, you guys. She prayed. And when she prayed, um, she actually, in her mind's eye, these images that she remembered of the hurt that her dad caused her, she said that those images were shattered and the pain was gone when she forgave her dad and her brother. After she graduated Biola, she went home and she lived with her dad. And she went to church where her brother was the worship band leader. How do you do that? And I know because I'm a rational, logical thinker, I think that's not possible. 
So I've asked her again and again, this was about nine or 10 years ago, I've asked her again and again, you know, how are you doing? She goes, I'm fine. Wow, only God can do that. So how do we forgive? A lot of what I'm gonna say is from a guy named Everett Worthington. He's one of the leading experts, evangelical conservative experts on forgiveness. He wrote about it, and then his own mother was actually murdered, and he got to practice it in a big way in his life. And he uses this formula called REACH, R. We recall the hurt. As I mentioned earlier, we don't bury it. We don't stuff it down. We bring up that hurt so that we can deal with it. E, we empathize. We see the person who hurt us as a person who hurts, as a person who's broken. And then we might even have compassion for them. We empathize with their situation, and that can help us to forgive them. Doesn't mean that they're good or what they did was good, right? But we empathize that they're broken, just like I'm broken. A, altruistic. This is a big word. John Lundy uses words like this. I use little words like it's something that's good, It's a gift, it's something that's good that we give someone, but it's also something good for ourselves. C, we commit to forgive. We commit intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, we commit to forgive this person, and then we hold on to that forgiveness. We will remember that hurt, and we will remember it as forgiven. We hold on to that. In fact, many times I will tell students to plant a flag at the foot of the cross with a date on when you forgave that person. Because you know that evil dude, he's going to come tell you that you really haven't forgiven them and you should pay them back. And when you hear that voice, you can say, hey, you could go talk to Jesus about that. That's been forgiven. So you can tell him where to go. Just wondering if you would see Biola students are so pure they didn't even get that why should I go to Biola reason number three million reach we reach for forgiveness Everett Worthington says I use Paul's example when I uh, try to work through forgiveness and when I work through forgiveness with students Paul says to bear with each other forgive one another (laughs) <laughs> and then I love the next word, if. <laughs> if any of you has a grievance against someone, as if that would happen, right? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So I try to use that model. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And so I tell students, first of all, let's pray and let's first confess our own sins. Because we have a list of our own sins, don't we? Where we've sinned against God. And so we lay out that list before the Lord and ask him to forgive us again. And we remember how evil our own hearts are. You see, somebody might hurt me, but I know all of my sins and thoughts, right? And so as one pastor I had used to say, I'm the biggest sinner in the room because I know all of my sins. So we confess our sins as the Lord forgave you And once we've done that, it's a lot easier to do the next step. Bring the person to Jesus in order to forgive that person. And many times this is done visually as people uh, think about taking someone who hurt them to the Lord. They'll see that in their mind's eye. I'm not visual, so I can't even do that. But I like that idea. You bring the person to Jesus and you announce forgiveness over them, and you ask Jesus to take care of that person. You take them off of your hook for revenge, for justice, and you give them to Jesus. Jesus, you take care of them. You're gonna do a better job than I am anyway, right? So the person whose dad was narcissistic, when she prayed, she saw an image. Her dad came into the image, and he walked up to her, and he started doing his sarcastic thing to his daughter, And she said, Jesus lifted up his arm and just went, not today. And she felt protected. That was pretty cool. You see, we trust Jesus with these people. If they repent, to show them grace and mercy. 
And I know you guys, I know they don't deserve it. But guess what? Neither do I. Neither do you. And so we trust them to Jesus for forgiveness if they repent or for justice if they don't repent. I told you this was easy in terms of topic, but hard in terms of application. Here it is. Do I need to forgive? Originally, I wrote this as, do you need to forgive? But I changed it to first person. So as you read this, it's for you. Do I need to forgive? Do I need to ask for forgiveness? And do I need to grant forgiveness? Well, we have about five minutes, you guys, to think about this. And so I'm going to have somebody come up and play something cool musically. And I want you to actually pray and ask the Spirit to show you, do I have unforgiveness in my life? Maybe even jot those names down before you leave the gym, okay? Do I need to ask for forgiveness? Do I need to grant forgiveness? Do I need to ask for forgiveness? Do I need to grant forgiveness? If this is the biggest open door to the evil one, this will be the hardest thing that you ever do. But the bondage of unforgiveness is not worth it. So the image that you see up on the screen is a gate that's open. And I hope that we walk through that gate and experience freedom and love and joy and peace and compassion. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.